Good morning again. Our next presenting company is Baytex Energy. They uh, have operations both in the U.S. and in Canada, both heavy and light oil, uh, producing over 150,000 BOE per day. Here to talk about Baytex is our CEO, Eric Greger. Please welcome Eric. Okay, on, on page two of our presentation, our advisories uh, will want to pay attention to the comments I make uh, relative to the advisories. And uh, I'm going to park here for just a minute, and I want to spend some time. Many of you uh, may not be familiar with Baytex. Um, this is, uh, Baytex is a North American oil-weighted E&P company. We're traded on both New York and Toronto. You can see over here on the right, there's a lot of volume. Uh, on both exchanges, distributed you know, a little bit more heavily toward the Canadian exchanges, but traded uh, both New York and Toronto. Um, we uh, returned capital to shareholders, 50% of our free cash flow generated, returned to, to, return to shareholders by way of two mechanisms, obviously share repurchases, which is the biggest part, uh, but also in the last quarter, uh, upon closing of our uh, recent acquisition by merger of Ranger Oil Company, in the Eagleford, we stood up uh, a fixed-based dividend, and that stands today at nine cents per share per year. And so, uh, relatively modest given today's uh, market capitalization and share price. That's about 1.6 percent base dividend yield. So modest, uh, but nevertheless, a combination of a fixed-based dividend yield and a share repurchase plan, and the combination of those two constitute 50 percent. Uh, of our free cash flow generated, allocated to uh, the return of capital shareholders. The other 50%, of course, is uh, taken to our balance sheet, and there'll be more slides where I can elaborate on this a little bit more. You see in the middle right panel, uh, we're definitely oil weighted, 84 to 86% uh, total liquids. That includes NGLs, 155,000 BOE a day. Um, we sit on a, on a large 2P reserves base, almost 700 million BOEs. Sit on a very large land base, 1.7 million net acres across Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Texas. 60% um, of our production comes out of uh, the Eagleford, and uh, the other 40% out of the Western Canadian Sedimentary Basin, WCSB. And that's a number of different assets, um, light oil assets, heavy oil assets, and some conventional assets as well. Um, and so I'll spend a little bit more time talking about this as I advance through the presentation. Um, I want to take a little bit of time here and just focus on um, the inventory. So within each of our core areas, we've got 10 or more years of, of inventory. We, we like to run these assets uh, basically level loaded within you know, one of several uh, operational efficiency bands, and I can spend a little bit more time in Q&A talking about that. Um, we've got a, a really healthy track record of new discoveries. This year alone, we've discovered two new conventional heavy oil plays. Uh, up in uh, Alberta, um, one just north of Edmonton. It's the Rex Formation, it's a clear water equivalent. We call it the Rex at Morinville. Um, and another one is a clear water equivalent called the Wasika. And that's in the Manville series, and, and that is uh, up around Cold Lake in Alberta as well. And so three new discover discoveries in three years in our conventional cold flow heavy play. Um, pretty steady diet going forward. We've got a very strong geoscience team. Three discoveries in three years, two this year alone. Again, I can talk more about that when I get into the assets or in Q&A. Strong free cash flow generation, and as I said, 50% goes to shareholders, the other 50% to strengthen our balance sheet. Um, the next milestone uh, within our balance sheet uh, progression and our uh, shareholder return framework is at $1.5 billion Canadian in uh, total debt. So once we achieve that level of total debt, which is uh, ascribed to uh, one turn of total debt to EBITDA at $50. We feel like that's a pretty strong uh, balance sheet position. And at that point in time, we will step uh, our shareholder returns framework up another notch to 75% return to shareholders. And at that time, we'll decide you know, whether or not we want to make changes to that uh, share repurchase plan and dividend or uh, whether we want to stick with uh, the current distribution or allocation between those. But that's the next milestone. And then, of course, even beyond a billion and a half uh, Canadian total debt, we'll continue paying down at a pace of 25% of free cash flow generated. 
So I want to speak just a little bit about uh, the recent uh, transaction. So we just completed and closed a transformative transaction that stood up uh, a full and capable operating team in the Eagleford. This is Ranger Oil Company, and uh, we have maintained the uh, operating, the entire operating team, uh, including the office in, uh, in West Houston, in Park 10 Place. Um, and, and this has become now our entire U.S. operating team. And so not only are we operating the Ranger assets uh, that Ranger Oil Company was, was operating uh, themselves, which are you know, oil-weighted, uh, very high-quality assets and almost 100% uh, operated, but that team will also eventually take responsibility for our substantial uh, working interest in Marathon's uh, operated interest in the Carnes Trough. We hold 25% working interest in 80,000 net acres in the Carnes Trough operated by Marathon. And we'll continue to use this team uh, and the operating capability to create value, uh, continuing to swap and trade and increase our operated working interest in our own lands, using, of course, the, the, the non-op uh, as a currency for those swaps and trades. Um, that, um, that transaction created, uh, obviously, you know, 12 to 15 years of additional inventory in the Eagleford, which, uh, which we see as a, a key piece of our business. Uh, sells at a premium, Magellan East pricing, very strong, uh, you know, operating team, low operating costs, uh, very high net backs. It's, it's really uh, a strong operating asset, and I can speak more to how that asset fits into our entire portfolio as we go through the assets. I think I've touched on most of this, but again, uh, the second half of the year will center on 155,000 BOE a day, call it 85% liquids weighted. Um, and our um, capital allocation is generally about 50% to uh, what would have been the standalone Ranger assets and, and about 50% to our what would have been standalone Baytex assets. So a little bit more weighting to the Eagleford uh, when you combine our operated non-op together. Um, but uh, that's all done in accordance with uh, a strong returns framework. And uh, speaking of returns, uh, at the half cycle level, the drilling economics across our portfolio, this is all at $75 WTI. You see uh, well payouts, uh, particularly in the clear water there with about eight months, ranging up to about 18 months in our Peace River in the Blue Sky Formation. Uh, eight to 18 months on simple well payouts at 75 TI with IRRs averaging 85. But you can see that our uh, clear water at Peavine is just off the charts, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. I talked about the balance sheet. We actually have two uh, bond issues outstanding. So we have a 2027 series with 410 million US uh, as a balance. And um, this, this past summer, uh, coincident with uh, the, the merger, um, we issued another 800 million into the market, and um, those uh, those bonds were there was a lot of demand for the bonds. Actually, we were very pleased. We actually raised it; they're five and a half times oversubscribed. Uh, we actually increased the size of the bonds and could have gone quite a, quite a bit further, but we wanted to uh, we wanted to grind the the rates tight, and so the coupons on those are both in the mid eights, um, and uh, and we're really pleased with the maturity, um, you know, the extended maturity here. We also have a $1.1 billion uh, revolving credit facility, which is not um, an RBL facility. This is a covenant-based facility, uh, matures in 2026, so not subject to redetermination, not subject to uh, reserves evaluation, excuse me, reserves evaluations. Um, I've spoken a little bit here about, uh, about the free cash flow, the 50% to the balance sheet, 50% to direct shareholders, and then I've, I've uh, chatted a little bit about uh, just what we do uh, before we hit $1.5 billion and what we do after we hit $1.5 billion. And so this is in the presentation deck. I want to spend some time here talking about the free cash flow generation uh, capability of the company. This is a very, very strong company generating substantial free cash flow. In fact, uh, we, just, we just announced as we closed uh, Q2 on the 27th, um, 500 million this year in free cash flow generation, 400 million in the second half of the year alone, uh, all forecast at $75 WTI. And you can see in the upper left panel, at $80 WTI, that's a, uh, basically equivalent to a 27% free cash flow yield. Um, and the allocation of shareholders is a 14% yield. So these are substantial free cash flow yields. 
Um, and you see over on the right-hand panel through the balance of our planning horizon, 2023 through 2026, at $80 WTI, the business will generate $4 billion of cumulative free cash flow. And considering where we trade today, um, you know, that basically buys the entire market cap of the company back in four years. We have a balanced approach to risk management. We take a pretty straightforward approach here. We like uh, two-way callers, simple two-way callers. Um, with the floor, the put set at $60 WTI. That's anchored to the highest. Uh, that's about a 15 to 20% B-tax uh, return uh, against our highest break-even asset. So as prices fall through that floor, we have uh, hedges that kick in, and then we can begin, uh, if prices continue to fall beyond that, begin to reallocate capital away from those assets as we move through lower and lower break-even assets. Um, and then, of course, we sell the calls in that two-way structure to fund those puts, and uh, we set those calls at $100. So it's a simple two-way, uh, 60 by 100 uh, costless or cashless uh, structure going out in time. And, uh, and we set the volumes based on the strength of our balance sheet. 40% of our net oil exposure um, corresponds to one turn of total debt to EBITDA. We dropped that to 30% at, uh, at 0.9 times, 20% at 0.8 times, and so on until we get to 0.5 times, which is our next milestone. And we consider that a, a strong enough balance sheet to not require hedges. This is just a sensitivity in our deck, and it's also on our webs on the in the presentation on our website. Because we've anchored everything in our deck on $75 WTI, we give a sensitivity around uh, WTI. A uh, lot of heavy oil exposure and WCS basis stiffs have been a meaningful uh, tailwind for us over the last couple of months, and so we also add a uh, sensitivity there. I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about our assets. I've got about nine minutes left. Uh, light oil Eagleford in the left-hand column. In the middle, we've got the light oil Canadian. That's our Viking and Duvernay. That's the Pembina Duvernay in, in the Western Shale Basin. And then our heavy oil, and that's the Peace River, Peavine, and the Lloydminster. I'll start with our light oil Eagleford. You can see in the upper right ellipse, uh, right along trend, that's uh, primarily weighted to the oil window along the Eagleford trend uh, in Lavaca and Gonzales and a little bit of DeWitt County. That's the Ranger assets here in the upper right ellipse, and then down uh, a little bit further to the left, you see a little higher thermal maturation, not a lot, but, but a little in the Carnes trough. And again, we have four AMIs, 25% working interest in 80,000 net acres there, operated by Marathon. Together, it's almost 270,000 gross acres, 92,000 BOE a day, and, and again, oil and liquids weighted. I want to spend some time here because I think one of the things that's really interesting when you, when you juxtapose the Eagleford historical performance um, and you vintage the well performance over time, both on a unit basis and on an absolute basis, I've got absolute in the upper right and I've got unit in the lower right, uh, BOE per foot on six-month QM productivity. And in the upper right, that's cumulative well production by year. And you can see that every year uh, the Ranger assets have done better, and some of that is just more contemporary designs. The industry has done a far better job delivering higher intensity to the reservoir, delivering much larger fracture surface areas and much more productive wells. But you see 15, 16, 17, right up through 2021, 22, and 23, the wells have progressively gotten stronger despite the fact that there's more development on the land. And this is, this is the continued evolution of the new Ranger team that is materially different from these are, these are people I've known. Uh, this is a team that I spent a lot of time with, uh, with in Canna uh, in both of our past lives. And one of the things I think that was unique that we recognized about the Ranger team and the Ranger assets that many others didn't was the fact that this team was only, only at the very, very beginning of unlocking the potential of the assets. And you can see here how, how substantially um, the, the well performance has improved over the last couple of years. Down in the lower right, of course, uh, shown a different way, uh, binned up by kind of like economic years or like economic uh, circumstances, six-month cum productivity continuing to increase. And then on the lower left, if you ring fence the lands in and around the ranger uh, position, you can see that uh, 
you know, it's not enough just to measure yourself against yourself over time, not enough to measure yourself against, uh, you know, yourself by unit or, or absolute over time, but it's really important to measure yourself against the best in the business. And in the lower left, the gray bar is marathon and the blue bar is EOG. And if you ring fence on the same land in the same reservoir with the same kind of DSU shape and opportunity, you can see that Ranger is outperforming uh, EOG consistently at 16, 18, and 24 months. And you can see that as time progresses on the x-axis, the Ranger performance is actually closing in on the marathon performance. So very, very sophisticated companies, uh, very well capitalized, excellent operating and, and technical capabilities. And you know, we, we include this because we want to help folks understand just how much is left in these assets, 12 to 15 years of inventory with continuous improvement. And this is, by the way, not what you hear today coming out of the Permian Basin. I'll, I'll leave that to the rest of you to decide, but uh, what you tend to hear about uh, progress coming out of the Permian Basin is actually degradation on a, on a per foot basis across most of the, most of the Permian, both sides. Um, and so we like to point this out because we think there are still pockets of real value where you can buy at a lower price, you can buy existing EBITDA, you can stand up capable teams, you can buy lots of reserves in the ground and do so at a full turn discount to what it might cost to get in the most expensive basins and take that value accretion and roll it into your shareholders over time. That's what we think we've accomplished with this transformational merger with uh, Ranger. Uh, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time here uh, spending, just, just discussing our uh, Viking light oil assets. They're weighted mostly uh, in the lower right ellipse uh, down to Saskatchewan. Uh, these are very repeatable. This is shallow light oil, very repeatable. Um, and then over on the left, you'll see a smaller ellipse. That's the Pembina Duvernay. And we're, we're really excited about this Duvernay. It's got a lot of uh, geomechanical and reservoir characteristics similar to the Eagleford. It's high pressure, it's uh, tight light oil, and uh, we just completed um, our demonstration phase. We drilled uh, two three-well pads. Uh, we're varying spacing. We've got, obviously, in those two three-well pads, two fully bounded wells four half-bounded wells, we're varying uh, cluster spacing, total flow area, hydraulic horsepower, uh, flow back differences, and we're running PVT and, and uh, watching the variability, just helping to populate an already fairly expansive multivariate regression model we have on the Duvernay. And uh, so far, we're very pleased. In fact, the wells are still building and we can't yet hang off a type curve, so um, we've had them on production for almost a month now. This is our heavy oil play, and you can see that uh, we've got some uh, Lloyd Minster scattered right along the Saskatchewan and Alberta border. Uh, you see the Wasika at Cold Lake. That's one of our new discoveries at the top of the ellipse on the right. And then just to the left, uh, you see the municipality of Edmonton. Just north of that, you see our Clearwater discovery in Morinville. Again, these are conventional heavy cold flow plays. Um, and you know, if you were to pray to the oil and gas uh, angels, you would say, show me a play where I can drill 15,000 meters of open hole in four or six or eight or 12 legs, and I can, and I can drill um, without the requirement of casing, cementing, or stimulation. I can just drill a hole in the rock, and I can pull out of the hole, and I can put 15,000 meters against a single wellhead, and it will flow, and it will flow at 800 to 1,500 barrels a day. This is what you've got. Peavine is uh, one of the most spectacular assets in the world, and you can see it uh, just below in that small uh, ellipse. Um, Baytex actually holds 20 of the top 20 wells in the Clearwater, and I think all of you being uh, students of the industry have heard a lot about the Clearwater. The Clearwater today as a play, as a horizon, uh, produces about 140 or 150,000 uh, BOE a day, and we produce uh, just under 10% of that, but we hold 20 of the top 20 wells, all out of Peavine. These are wells that generally cost around $2 million, maybe a little less, uh, Canadian, to drill, and they'll produce 1,000 to 1,500 barrels a day. And so you can see that the, the, the economics would be absolutely spectacular, and that's why um, the Peavine uh, IRRs were just off the chart and why the payouts are so short. Um, and that was, by the way, when I talk about the Wasika at Cold Lake, I talk about the Rex at Morinville, the third of those three, those were our two discoveries this year alone, but the Peavine was discovered two years ago, and it's the same geoscience team continuing to march around our very large land base in the Manville and discover additional. So we've got, we've got continued exploration out there today. Um, you know, this, this just goes through kind of well costs and, uh, and, and comparisons. 
and uh, I, I, won't, I won't speak much to this. I will spend just a few minutes uh, discussing our ESG position. So we just finished our 2022 uh, TCFD and ESG reports. Uh, they're out on our website. Please take a look at them. I couldn't be more proud of the team. The company is working very, very hard. As a matter of fact, um, with our uh, new acquisition of Ranger, uh, not only was it accretive on, on every financial metric and unit operating metric that we were interested in, including free cash flow per share, operating cash flow per share, revenue per BOE, um, and allowed us to increase our allocation of uh, free cash flow to shareholders, uh, but also reduced our GHG intensity by 16%. So, you know, it was just, it was just the most obvious thing for us to do to, to simultaneously uh, improve the business on all the financial metrics. Uh, create a more sustainable uh, GHG intensity over time and uh, create an operating team in the United States where it, it really creates kind of this broad-based, diversified, oil-weighted company we, uh, we want to be. Um, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you ponder at this, but again, uh, just up through 2022, uh, we had already achieved a 59% reduction in our GHG intensities. Our target was 65%. And we've gone beyond the end of 2022 this year, and so we're already closing in on our on our 2025 target. So, well ahead on that. Very proud of that. We do a lot of water recycling. Uh, we use effluent wastewater uh, in uh, wastewater effluent in Pembina for our Duvernay. Uh, we use a lot of uh, our SAGD steam generation. When that steam uh, has come off and condensate and, and it's and it's done. Uh, we use that for makeup water in our Viking stimulation. So a lot of, uh, a lot of water uh, recycling that we're very proud of as well. Okay, with that, um, I'll, be, I'll be over in the Q&A room if anybody wants to join me. Otherwise, it's very nice seeing everyone. Thank you.